I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. Together, Megan and I host Chairside Live, our weekly program that features a case of the week where I go and grab a case off the lab floor sent in by a real dentist, and together we'll look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of this and many other cases. And I take questions from viewers regarding techniques and materials, and I'll also keep you up to date on the latest dental news. So go ahead and enter your email address in the box above and hit subscribe and make sure you get a nice, fresh edition of Chairside Live in your inbox every Wednesday. I'm Dr. Michael Detola. And I'm Megan Strong. Good news, you can now get credit for past Chairside Live episodes. Go to chairsidelive.com and click the CE logo, answer a few easy questions and you'll get credit. And if little Johnny won't brush his teeth, maybe it's time to ship him off to Nigeria. And Megan and I will have a spirited debate over whether or not something she found on the beach this weekend is actually part of the human body or not. That and more on this week's Chairside Live. Well, welcome to episode 59 of Chairside Live. Megan, how are you today? I'm doing really well. This past weekend was gorgeous, and so my husband and I went to the beach, and I found something that I would like to present to you now. I think this can go in our prop closet. Does this, we can maybe get a shot of it sometime. I don't know, maybe James, our producer, can get a shot of it later. But does that shell look like a tooth or what? Come on. I, I could see how you would think it looks like a tooth. I'm not sure which tooth you think it, it looks like. Um, it kind of could, does. but when you spend your life staring at teeth like we have. Um, can you just give it to me that it looks remotely just a tiny bit like a tooth? It looks more like a tooth than, say, a camel, for example. <laughs> but, but I'll have you... Anyway, uh, During the break, I'll have you uh, stand up in front of the mirror and hold it up by one of your teeth, and you can point and show me which one you think it looks like. It looks more like a tooth than the fruit fly buzzing around my face, for example. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I will, in fact, grant you. Uh, we have an interesting case of the week for you guys today. This is something I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but uh, it's a case of the week where uh, a well-meaning general practitioner sent uh, a patient to an oral surgeon to have an implant placed, and the oral surgeon actually did a really good job placing the implant. But then he got the patient back, and he put a stock abutment in place. And the stock abutment's not such a great job, and he charged the patient for the stock abutment. And then he sent the patient back to the dentist to put an impression coping in place, took the impression, sent it into the lab, and we looked at it and we just knew it wasn't going to work. And the dentist said, I had a feeling it wasn't going to work either. And we ended up having to make a custom abutment, which worked really well. And now all of a sudden, this poor patient has had to pay for the abutment twice. Let's stop talking about it and take a look at it. Here's the case of the week with the case of the stock abutment versus the custom abutment. I was walking through the implant department the other day and I saw a case. And it's a case that we see fairly frequently. And I guess you could say that while it d doesn't necessarily make a case for general dentists placing their own implants, it certainly makes a case for general dentists taking over one step after that and being in charge of the abutment selection and or placement. So this is a dentist who had the specialist that he refers to place the implant and that went fine, but then said specialist went ahead and placed a stock uh, abutment, and this is not the stock abutment, this of course is the analog, but when you look at this abutment you'll notice a couple things, and the first one is that the margins of this abutment are about four millimeters subgingival. So this is going to be a really subgingival crown, and as I turn this sideways you'll notice that the very most coronal portion of that stock abutment is just about one millimeter supragingival. But even then, the super gingival portion, as you look at it, is still about one millimeter subgingival to the gingival level of the first molar. So we, we've really got something here that doesn't have a lot of support. And imagine the crown here, obviously the crown to root ratio or the crown to implant ratio. There's just going to be a ton, a metric ton of tooth structure, of crown structure here before we finally get down onto the abutment itself. And so this is really not going to be a very good situation. The stock abutments, this is a five millimeter tall stock abutment, and you'll see some seven millimeter tall stock abutments. Strauman makes one, so you could get an extra uh, two millimeters of height here, maybe at the most, but that's about it. They don't get much taller than that. But even let's say if somebody made, say, a 13 or a 15 millimeter uh, stock abutment, 
we've still got these margins that are four millimeter subgingival here, really just kind of buried along here. And so this is one of those times where um, a stock abutment is just not a, a great choice. Um, stock abutments like this tend to cost around $175. And um, the surgeon actually charged uh, the patient for this abutment. And so it's a, it's a way sometimes for specialists to be able to add a little onto the implant fee. They can charge the patient for placing the implant and then charge for the abutment as well. And then we get the case like this from the doctor um, who takes an abutment level impression and we get it and look at it and say, wow, doc, this is gonna be really difficult to make a good crown from. We'd really like to do a custom uh, abutment here for it to be prosthetically successful. And in this case, fortunately, the doctor said okay and he was willing to go for it. Um, but now all of a sudden the doctor is gonna be paying and charging the patient for uh, a custom abutment as well. And so now the patient's kind of getting charged twice for this and so this dentist is probably gonna have to call the specialist and say, hey, look, you know, thanks, but no thanks, you, you put this stock abutment on, but it really can't be used. And you can tell this is a specialist who hasn't done a lot of restorative dentistry. I mean, you and I as GPs, if we put on the stock abutment, we look at this and go, um, that's probably not gonna work you know, for a crown. Would you ever prepare a crown like this and go, yeah, that's gonna work, no problem. You know, If this were a tooth, would you ever think to yourself, this is gonna work fine, we're not gonna have an issue. No need for a buildup here. Um, that's going to work out just fine. Uh, no, that would never occur to you. But for the specialist, this was going to be okay. But we know that's not going to be okay. And so this general dentist um, took off that abutment, took an implant level impression for us, and took a pretty darn good impression, used a, a full tray, a closed tray uh, impression. And I just was playing around with the uh, coping in there and actually popped through it. But it was a closed tray impression, and it was a full arch impression in a plastic tray uh, and it came out fine and we had the opportunity to make, to switch this with the same implant to a custom abutment. This happens to be a Nobel Replace uh, wide platform implant. Again, a word on the stock abutments, you know, if they average around say 175 bucks for a stock abutment, I would say that we have to modify around 85 to 90% of the stock abutments that we see here in the laboratory. And there's a $75 cost uh, for that. And so all of a sudden we're up to about $250 on the cost for a stock abutment once we have to modify it. And the two most common reasons um, we have to modify a stock abutment are we either have to reduce the occlusal height um, because there's not enough reduction, or we have to uh, drop the margins subgingival on it because it's not going to be a very aesthetic solution. So all of a sudden we're up to $250 on a stock abutment that has to have adjustments made, where when you look at um, a custom abutment, uh, our charge for that is $299. And so $250 for a stock abutment with modifications versus $299 for a custom abutment and you can see that this really fits the bill. The margins are exactly where we want them to be, just slightly subgingival. You can see the occlusal reduction is now in the correct place. You know, we've got about a millimeter and a half of, of occlusal reduction where we need it to be. We've got a nice margin represented all the way around here. Uh, because of the fact it's a second molar, the doctor prescribed Bruxer. So let me put this Bruxer crown on here. And there's the Bruxer crown in place, uh, patient biting together. And so with the uh, custom abutment that we have in place now, we've got some nice dimensions on the crown itself, as opposed to when we had the stock abutment here, we were just gonna have a huge chunk of zirconia that was gonna be four millimeters subgingival with just this huge mass of restorative material um, sitting on top of that uh, with just this really short implant, a bad crown to root ratio. And you contrast that to what we're able to do with the custom abutment. And so the custom abutment really is the right choice here. Um, unfortunately, the patient may have had to pay for this particular uh, abutment twice because of the fact that the surgeon um, was, was billing out for that stock abutment uh, on his own. So I get the fact that most GPs don't wanna place, um, probably wanna place implants on their own, and that's fine. Certainly no, 
no judgment uh, on whether or not you necessarily have to be doing that. But when it comes to that second part, when it comes to who's going to make the decision uh, about the abutment and whether or not it's going to be a stock abutment or a custom abutment, that would seem like it really does fall in the realm of the restorative dentist, of the general practitioner, because, you know, it's pretty simple as a GP to look at this and look at this and decide which one's going to make the better basis for the crown. I mean, just pretend this is a tooth and that's a tooth. And I think most GSP, GPs would look at this and go, there's no way that's going to work for a crown. And this has a very high chance of working for a crown. I mean, really, what GP would ever put that in and entertain the notion that that's going to work, knowing that there's a custom abutment um, that could look like that. And, and for a specialist to put that in and think a GP is going to be able to make that work. Um, yeah, I granted that's just one specialist, but still, it's very easy to come to the conclusion that really the restorative dentist, the GP, uh, should be the one uh, stepping in and making the decision as to what type of abutment should be used in an implant case such as this. And there is our implant. So again, it's placed at a nice level, but again, you can see how a stock abutment placed in there would just not get the job done. And when the stock abutment was in there, you know, considering that most of these are just five millimeters tall, you know, not only do we end up with super subgingival margins, but we ended up with coronal margins that barely cleared uh, the gingival tissue. And then you contrast that with what we're able to do uh, with the custom abutment, where we're able to bring those margins up to the, the fact up to the level where they're just slightly um, subgingival or equigingival in this case, because it is a lower second molar. And we're not worried about aesthetics and we're able to get proper occlusal reduction and nice taper and just everything about it now looks like a good tooth preparation and it's clear that that's uh, the right way to go and in the patient's best interest and the dentist's best interest and the Brux or Crown's best interest all at the same time. So I want to encourage GPs who are doing this type of restorative dentistry, make sure you're the one who gets to make the call on what kind of abutment is going to be used in an implant restorative case such as this. Now let's go to a segment we call Viewer Mail. This week's viewer mail comes to us from Dr. Lydia Suarez, and she writes, Hello, Dr. Detola. I recently graduated from an AEGD program at the University of Florida. Glidewell Laboratories impressed me with their excellent work and commitment to stay updated with state-of-the-art dental technology. Thank you so much, especially to you. Your videos have been very helpful to me. I watched the webinar from Viva Learning that you gave recently called Modern Post and Core Placement. During it, you mentioned that sometimes you use PFM for bridges because they are more resistant to fracture than zirconia. Could you please explain indications and contraindications of zirconia compared to PFM bridges? Thank you so much for your help. Well, Lydia, you were paying attention and you did listen. And um, I have frequently stated that since probably 2009, I haven't done a single unit PFM. I have been pretty much all uh, full contour zirconia or bruxer in the posterior areas of the mouth and even on the bicuspids and sometimes in the anterior regions of the mouth if I've seen a patient who's got a lot of wear or a patient who's broken PFM crowns or other all ceramic crowns. Otherwise, I'll go with a lithium disilicate material like Emax in the front. So uh, an easy way for me to say it is for single units, I really like Emax in the anterior regions of the mouth and bruxer in the posterior regions of the mouth. But when we get to bridges, it's a little bit different. Um, obviously, we have higher strength requirements when we're going to go with a bridge. And so I've seen some dentists who say, oh, well, then I'll go with the stronger Bruxer material. But Bruxer, even though you know we can hit it with a hammer, I don't know if you've seen our little video that we do where we take a single unit Bruxer crown and hammer it into a two by four and it doesn't break. But you'll notice we do that with a single unit crown and not with a bridge because as a single unit crown, uh, Bruxer fractures less than any other restoration that we have in dentistry with the exception of a cast gold crown because that never fractures when you hit it with a hammer. But that being said, Bruxer is still an all ceramic crown and still fractures more than metal does even though it doesn't fracture all that much. So when you take a bridge and look at something like an all ceramic bridge like a Bruxer bridge, it still fractures more. Uh, than a PFM bridge even does because that's got the benefit of that metal substructure that is going to be stronger than the Bruxer bridge. 
So when it comes to deciding when to do it or when not to do it, it's difficult to decide chair side. And a lot of times it's going to be one of those game time decisions where you're almost going to want to prep it and send it to the lab and ask for the lab to help you. Because it, a lot of times that's what I do because the lab's going to actually scan the mounted models and then actually make some measurements. And that's going to be when they make the decision as to what material they're going to use. Let me use a couple bridges to help show what I mean by that. One of the determining factors whether or not we can do a bridge out of full zirconia like this one is something we refer to in-house as the rule of 27. And what the rule of 27 is, is when we talk about the connection between a pontic and an abutment, we need to have 27 square millimeters and what we're talking about is the height squared times the width. And so basically three by three, three millimeters by three millimeters um, squared between um, the pontic and the abutment. And so three times three times three would be 27. And that's what we need for this to be strong enough uh, to be able to withstand chewing in the posterior. This is what we're talking about for replacing one tooth in the posterior. So to achieve that, you can see there's a couple different ways. On this bridge, for example, you can see it's a broad, wide contact. In fact, it looks like it's really wider than it needs to be. And that's because there's been super eruption of the molar across from it. And to go to another extreme, we have a very narrow case over here where we've got a lot of room and we're making up that dimension uh, in an occlusal gingival direction. And then we have another one where it's kind of in the middle and a more normal situation where the occlusal table is a more normal width in a buccolingual direction and uh, kind, of a, kind of the more prototypical shape that you would see. It's very difficult to try to measure something like this in the mouth on your own without mounted models with the patient's tongue and cheek in the way. And so we need to be able to do this. You can't take this to an extreme. You know, you can't have uh, a bridge that would be, say, um, just half a millimeter uh, thick from occlusal to gingival and then uh, 10 millimeters wide, something like that. There is a point where it becomes too thin uh, in an occlusal gingival direction. Um, we're not even sure exactly where that number is. But anytime it gets close, to a violation of the rule of 27, we're going to call you and say, let's go with PFM just to be safe. Another problem we see, even if we have a bridge that's rule of 27 compliant, so we have something where the thickness is enough on the connector between the ponic and the abutment, if the doctor has not reduced enough on the molar, if this is a second molar like it is here, um, and we've only got, let's say, one millimeter of reduction on the occlusal surface of this distal abutment, and the bite is high here for whatever reason, and the doctor has to reduce here and reduces a couple tenths of a millimeter, so now the thickness back here, let's say, is around five tenths of a millimeter. Um, even though the thickness of the connector here, with the rule of 27 has not been violated, if the thickness here is at half a millimeter due to occlusal adjustments, we'll often see uh, a Bruxer bridge fracture right, right along this area, even though the connector is intact and it'll be sent back to us with a fracture right along this area as well. And if that was a PFM bridge, that would not have fractured, although we would have a metal occlusal right in this area, uh, but it would not fracture. And the patient might have been okay with a metal occlusal right in that area. In fact, the patient would, have, would not have had a choice that would be the only restoration they could have at that point with half a millimeter of reduction is a metal occlusal in that area. And so um, just to kind of sum it up, when we look at some of those bridges of the same sizes in cross section, and I just took a little magic marker here and marked what those connector sizes look like. For example, that's the one in the, the middle, the more normal size bridge where we're gonna get our three squared by three millimeters, you can see on that more normal one. I'll just set this one down here. And then we'll take a look at, say, the wider one where we have a super erupted tooth so we don't have as much room in the occlusal gingival dimension. And then the other one where we have much more room occlusal gingivally but not as much room uh, buccolingually. 
Um, and so you can see the shape of that is much taller from top to bottom, from occlusal to gingival, and then not as wide. So all of these add up to 27 square millimeters, but they just do it in a different shape. Some do it more buccolingually, like the one over here, and some do it more occlusal gingivally. These are all rule of 27 compliant uh, and won't fracture in that area of the connector. But this also assumes that we have at least six tenths of a millimeter of reduction on the occlusal surface on either side of this connector for it to be strong enough. So when it ships, it'll have at least six tenths of a millimeter. But you have to keep in mind that those minimum dimensions, if it requires occlusal adjustment, you need to make that adjustment on the opposing tooth and not on the bridge itself. And so even though I began this segment uh, saying that uh, all, out of all the single crowns that I've done for the last four years, I haven't done a single unit PFM crown, I do in fact still do PFM bridges because of this reason. There are still some liabilities uh, with these all ceramic bridges and a lot of times I err on the side of safety and not having the patient have a restoration break in their mouth. So even though I've done just Emacs and Brooks or single unit crowns since 2009, I do still do um, PFM bridges in the posterior, especially for doing something like this, replacing a missing lower first molar if the patient doesn't want an implant. Just because I'm not into having fractures like this, I don't see any reason not to. I mean, it's, it's replacing a lower first molar. It's not a high aesthetic area. It's not a big deal for me to put a PFM bridge down there. I want something that's gonna last. I'm very into longevity. So in the anterior, I don't hesitate to do a Bruxer bridge. In fact, if I'm just replacing a lateral incisor, I wouldn't hesitate to do an Emax bridge either. It's really just in the posterior where I'm going to think long and hard and maybe do a PFM bridge, uh, especially if I prepare it and send it off to my technician and they say, wow, we're really close on the rule of 27, or you know what, because of the reduction we have there, let's go with a PFM. I'm going to lean that way anyway. I just don't want something to break in the patient's mouth. So thank you very much, Lydia. That's a great question and really shows that you're thinking a lot about material choice. That was a great letter. It was. And we actually, we have another one, but I'm sort of hesitant to read it because I think it might be spam. How would we get spam at Chair Sign Live? I don't know, but well, I'll, I'll read it. We'll give it a shot. Tell me what you think. All right. All right. How are things? I am Svetlana. I seek a boyfriend. My hobbies are hiking and cinematography. Reply to me by email. Sincerely, Svetlana. Well, Dr. Svetlana, as you probably know, most of my free time is, is taken up lecturing. A lot of it taken up uh, with Chairside Live. A lot of it uh, is taking up just doing things. Uh, Megan and I have a lot of similar interests. Uh, we both like to crash on mountain bikes and things like that. And the rest of my time, I did have a chunk of time open, uh, but now it's really, I'm spending a lot of time. Uh, I've been very fortunate lately uh, uh, there's a Nigerian prince who's taken a lot of interest in my life. And what I've been doing is just, um, I, I, my luck is unbelievable, really. Uh -huh. I feel like I've won the lottery. Uh, all I've had to do is send several small sums, just a couple thousand dollars each time, over to this Nigerian prince. And uh, he and I have become quite fast friends, actually. And uh, what he's going to do is, once the money is released, his parents, I'm actually going to tear up if I talk about this. His parents were killed in a bloody coup uh, several years ago in the mm -hmm. palace. And um, once the, the, the funds are freed up, I'm actually going to split it with him. And okay. I will get my half of the all, nearly $20 million uh, in Nigerian uh, rupees. I think it's right. rupees. I, mm -hmm. I'd have to look it up again. And he will transfer that over. And for now, there's just some administrative costs that sure. I've been helping him right. pay. I, I'm not sure why he has no money now, but I've been helping him pay that. And so, unfortunately, I've been spending a lot of time with uh, a prince of my own, but I wish you luck in finding a prince of your own, and unfortunately, it's not me. Uh, uh, I have some friends I might be able to introduce you to, uh, but otherwise, I'm sorry. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, I saw you sent a picture along, uh, Megan. Uh, yes. The, the, she, she looks okay, a little... Um, uh, greasy for my taste uh, on the surface, but I really, desperate. I really can't say anything because just about every other time we do chair side lights, somebody has to run up and powder me mm -hmm. because I'm Italian and 
I also glisten. <laughs> I also people write in all the time, and, yeah, and tell me, and uh-huh. uh, they want to know if I'm pregnant. Yeah, I, I right. appear to be glowing, You're glowing. exactly, mm-hmm. and uh, that's not it. So the pot should not call the kettle black. But okay. uh, I'm going to say Dr. Suarez should, yes. in fact, be the viewer mail letter of the week. Would you agree? I would agree. And look how wonderful this photo is. We've got some attitude working for us. We do. I yeah. like that one. We look like we've got uh, some attitude, and we look like we have something to give Dr. Suarez. And yes. It would be the Chairside Live water bottle. It is, and this is the last one. And cool. uh, I think we're going to be debuting a new. Stay tuned. It's going to be good. It's a it's a new uh, giveaway next week, and uh, someone's going to be lucky and be the first recipient for uh, the all brand new uh, Chairside Live giveaway. And these are all collective uh, collector items, by the yes, way. Yes, absolutely. Retail value, um, priceless. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, close to fifteen dollars. Some on. people might say, but uh, I like to say priceless. So. All right, very good. Thanks again Mm -hmm. uh, for writing in. We always appreciate hearing uh, from the viewers. And do you have any news stories for us What do you think? I don't think you do. I think it's time to wrap it up. That about wraps it up. Oh, you do? I do, yes. Researchers have found a link between oral bacteria and fetal death. Apparently, there are some oral bacteria that have the ability to leave the oral cavity and travel to other parts of the body, including the placenta. About 700 species of bacteria live in the mouth. Some can enter the blood and establish colonies in various parts of the body, allowing other oral bacteria in. Inflammation then occurs, leading to plaque in the heart, erosion of the bone, or bacteria in the lungs that can cause a newborn's death. Once the bacteria cause inflammation, they become pathogens that incite disease. Thanks to a new four-year, $1.6 million grant, the researchers will continue to study the connection between adverse pregnancy outcomes and oral bacteria, and hopefully we'll find a way to stop the bacteria from leaving the mouth. God, I wish we would have ended the show. I know, isn't that depressing? That is, wow. Way to bring it down. I'm sorry. Remove all sharp objects from the uh, news desk. That's scary. I uh, when you sent that story over, I mm-hmm. hadn't uh, I hadn't seen that before. That's um, that's amazing. That's uh, it's pretty terrifying. I'm glad they're researching it and getting a chance to look into that. Definitely, and, and, and gonna hopefully get some more information about that. But that was uh, really kind of amazing, and uh, it's one of those times where it's uh, you look at uh, the body of knowledge that we have as we begin to research things, and you're like, yeah. Maybe life was better when we didn't know so right. much. <laughs> Ignorance is bliss. It kind of is. Yeah. You know, there's times where you think, yeah, it was just kind of better when uh, yeah, I didn't know we that. didn't know what happened. And, uh, and there was just times where something happened and you thought, well, I guess that's you know, how it was maybe mm-hmm. kind of supposed to be. But uh, eventually, I guess knowledge leads to um, cures or treatments at least. And uh, so we'll keep Let's our help. fingers crossed on that one. Definitely. But that, that was one of the more kind of surprising stories. It and was. I guess for some people who have been following that, it may not have been. But when I saw that and you know, leading to fetal death, it was like, wow, that was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully you're going to flip the, flip the script and turn it around and we're going to go out on a high note now. We are. Here are we, we go. It, okay. it's, we're about, it's a fun story. We'll go now. Life affirming. Yes. All right. Very I'm happy. Ready. Pick me up. Okay, here we go. I'm picking you up. If you thought wrangling your three young kids together to brush their teeth was a grand victory, then prepare to be amazed. More than 300,000 Nigerian school children recently set a record for the largest number of people brushing their teeth at the same time. The Nigerian Dental Association organized hundreds of events across the city of Lagos to teach kids about good oral hygiene. They beat the previous record set in India in 2007 when 177,000 people brushed together. Go Nigeria! That's uh, that's impressive. It's a nice grassroots effort to kind of get the word out there about toothbrushing. And uh, I feel like, though, anything you can do to get kids out of class, they're going to do it. Absolutely. Brush their teeth, comb their hair, tie their shoe. It doesn't matter. If I'm out of class, I'm there. Yeah, I mean, like, even fear factor stuff. You know, eating yeah. grubs. Ew. Um, I feel like... Uh, Maybe for boys. Yeah, I feel like you know, changing the oil on a car. I mean, I, I, I think all, almost anything to get out of class. I mean, anything. You say getting kids out of class, but anything that we can do to tie fun into brushing their teeth or good or flossing or whatever it may be, I think that's going to be the real um, important tool to use with kids because kids love fun. So I, Flossing's a good idea. 
Ms. Flossing mm -hmm. is the tougher right. habit of the two to get started. I think I think flossing would be a good one, and I'd like to see it be one continuous piece of floss. Because right. now there's a real degree of difficulty there right. where a, a piece of floss that stretches from, say, here to, say, Las Vegas. That can't be sanitary. Well, you're going to leave a good couple feet between each Especially kid. Especially once you get they're to the Vegas gonna, border. <laughs> they're going to put, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. you keep it away from the brothels for the <laughs> most part. You right. weave in and out in, in between uh -huh. them, but brushing probably is a better idea right. than flossing. But this would be a great time to talk about sealants at the same time, too, yeah. and pass out a bunch of pamphlets and see if we can start a whole revolution for sealants at mm -hmm. the same time. All right, awesome. Thank you. You did Lift it right take back us up. out on a bang, yes. and I feel happy now. Great. I can leave. I'm walking on sunshine. It's part of my job. It's what I do. <laughs> it's what you do. All mm -hmm. right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That about wraps it up for this week's edition of Chairside Live. On behalf of myself, Megan, the whole CSL staff, and everybody here at the lab, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next time. I was going to say how Parker, the perfect puppy, jumped into the water at the beach and I was going to show a picture or have James put up a picture. The cutest thing ever. He was, he jumped into the wave with Brandon and was swimming all around. Oh, it was so cute. I loved it. Then he pulled the tooth shell out. If you can't get your kid to brush their teeth. No touch. Sorry. Oh, we're going to start the whole show over. <laughs> oh. Paint my head. Just, there you go. So weird. Never gets, never gets, never old. gets old.